this is Jackie with TheCuttingEdgeCulture.com. I'm here with Jeremy of Comeback Kid, and we are here at Auto Bar. It's a little bit chilly, not too bad. And you guys have been a band for 10 years or more. What do you think, or what's your opinion on the evolution of the hardcore scene since the inception of your band? Um, well, things have changed a bit. I, like, I guess I probably noticed more of a change from when I got into it than when we started the band, because I think like when I got into it in the 90s, it was a lot more you know, DIY, you know, really, I don't know, like now with the internet, it's so different, right? So I think a band like Hatebreed, like from where they came from and from where they, and to where they went, and I think the scene kind of went with that, you definitely saw, you know, just a lot more access to mainstream, you know, avenues like, you know, videos being played on MTV, like in the past, and, you know, a little more radio play for bands that would have never gotten that kind of play, like in the late 90s kind of thing, so... You know, those kind of things have changed. And I think, you know, even just like, you know, things like politics, um, this, that, and the other, you know, things that uh, I think meant a lot to the hardcore scene, you know, back 20 years ago may have faded a little. Not to sound like a jaded old person, but that's, you know, that that's something I feel that I've, you know, witnessed, you know, just, you know, some change. But at the same time, there's there are also newer bands and, you know, more recent bands that, you know, kind of embrace that and, you know, it's... It's still cool. The hardcore ideals are alive and well, but just not as much at the forefront of the scene as they may have once been. I would agree with that. So what do you think is the future of the scene? Where do you see it going? I don't know. Like, I mean, if you're to look at history in general, things kind of like often, you know, come full circle. So who knows? We might like head back to like, it's so hard to predict the future, but it's probably not out of the question for, you know, a certain segment of people just to be like, you know, fuck this shit like where it's you know gone and you know like kind of there'll be a backlash to what it's become i i could like not saying that'll happen but it wouldn't surprise me if that did you know but there'll always be like you know people that care people that are just in it for whatever you know so who knows where it's gonna be really and you guys have really traveled the world what are some similarities you see talk about diy uh what are some of the similarities you've seen sort of all around the world when it comes to fans and their reaction to your music similarities uh i think there's always sort of been that sort of like interaction with band and audience you know that you don't necessarily find as much in other scenes um like you know we go to japan and that's gonna be one of the toughest places that we out of the countries we've been to communicate with the average person but there's still sort of that like live energy, you know, kind of band crowd interaction, singing along, stage diving, you know. So that's that's probably like the the, the most you know common thing that you'll see that just kind of makes you feel at home even when you're overseas. So you know, and even for like kids that travel, like you know, there'll be like hardcore festivals, like you know, like this is hardcore, San Fury Rain Fest in Seattle. And, you know, kids from all over, like, wherever, Europe, Australia, Asia, you know, they'll fly in for that. And, you know, they kind of feel like they fit in, even though, like, when they're in America, they're kind of, like, you know, maybe a little lost because <laughs> things are so different because there's no public transportation they understand or, <laughs> or whatever. But when they're at the show, it's like, you know, they're at home, you know, so. Any plans for another tour DVD? Tour DVD? Uh, not, not anything that we've talked about. Like, I mean, we put out one in 2000. I think it was, I think we were shooting it in 2007, and, you know, that was just like an idea we had at the time, it was like, hey, let's just do a, you know, a tour DVD of us in Europe on one tour, and it just kind of evolved into a little more of a documentary kind of thing over the band's career or whatever, but, you know, we're probably, our focus right now is just on getting a new record out, but after that, that's one of those things that, you know, kind of comes after, like, a new record's kind of, you know, you do one, two, three more records, get them out of the way, and then you can kind of like do another segment of the band if we're uh, still alive and kicking. So that that's definitely something that uh, we would definitely consider in the future, but right now it's not in the... Uh, I don't see it happening in the next year or two, but... Fair enough. Maybe next record or two. There you go. Your, your last album was released in 2010, uh, and as Andrew mentioned briefly, uh, very slowly starting to work on the next record. What's the yeah. progress with that? Uh, I'd say we're about 1% done. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we're just we're just throwing ideas around for like times and see it's really difficult because uh, there was a time when we all lived in the same city. And now we're really spread out, you know, with member changes and this, that, and the other. 
life. So it's yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot harder just to like allocate like you know time, you know, because we all have to be in the same place at the same time to you know pull this off. So um, right now we're just kind of like working on our you know tour schedule for the upcoming five, six, seven months, and in there we definitely have to lock down some time to you know do some do some serious like collaborating because Andrew and myself do most of the writing so we kind of do that on our own and then we get together with Kyle our drummer and kind of build it up like rip it apart and build it back you know that's how we work on songs so yeah we'll need to get together for that but I don't know hopefully uh, next year sometime we'll be able to focus a little more than we have and now we got a train <laughs> probably the loudest train I could possibly have found that's awesome Boy. I can just talk closer and louder. Oh, there, <laughs> oh, we're good, we're good. All right. Well, I have to ask, I guess, the classic Canadian question, or at least one of two. Uh oh. What are your thoughts? What is poutine? No. I know, and I don't want to elaborate. Uh, what are your thoughts on the NHL of lockout? That's not a Canadian problem. That's a no, it's, American it's problem. No, it's clearly, <laughs> clearly more of an American problem. But... <laughs> I've run into Americans who are just as bummed as I am. Um, but no, it sucks. It's like... Especially for uh, my city in particular, because anybody that's familiar with uh, the NHL knows that uh, Winnipeg got its NHL team back after 15, 16 years of of, uh, of, of an absence of an NHL team. So, you know, we had a great year. It was kind of like the honeymoon year, because even though the team didn't make the playoffs and didn't do the greatest for the most part, um, it was still just like we kind of felt like we were a real city again you know it's like we got stripped of our nhl pride and uh now we got it back now what and then of course the lockout has to roll up right after the first year so i don't know it's, it is what it is you know fucking idiots with money fighting over money i mean i understand there's i understand the politics of it but at the same time it's like you guys are such fucking tools like how much money is being tossed around and, yeah but hopefully they can figure it out because, you know, there's there's those of us that uh, just want to watch hockey. And, you know, it sucks that it's such a corporate this, that, and the other, but, you know, it's another thing that propaganda talks about. You know, it's just that the first song they play, uh, Co Dear Coach's Corner, you know, it's kind of like about, you know, hockey and, like, you know, you just can't let it go, but you love the game so much. But um, <laughs> but I kind of went off track there, but, yeah, it sucks. And hopefully the lock will end so we can watch some good hockey. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I just want to watch some sports. Yeah. Just give me that, please. Uh, last few times we talked, uh, the first time we talked was at South by So What? And then last time I saw you guys was Bamboozle. Uh, what are the benefits of playing big festivals? like? Um, pretty much just like exposure to, uh, you know, you're just basically hoping you can play to people that you've never seen that would be in you. You know, it's, for a band like us, we're not well known, you know, in the realms of, uh, you know, big label huge arena selling bands you know so you know to be able to play those festivals where you're going to have you know like Foo Fighters headline uh, you know and there's going to be people walking by they're like oh wait I'm, let's go check them you know so that's all we're hoping for is just to play to people that would be into this that maybe never had the opportunity to check us out so it's not our favorite you know venue to play because you know we don't like barricades and it's always kind of weird playing outside, you know, a band that sounds like us, so, you know, we definitely prefer the smaller clubs, but it's, you know, being able to, you know, that, that challenge of trying to win over some new fans is, uh, you know, changes it up and it's fun, you know, for what it is. And getting to watch Bon Jovi. And getting to watch a few big bands that you <laughs> don't really want to pay $150 to see. There you go. <laughs> so what are some of the benefits of playing smaller club tours like this? Um, it's just, yeah, this is, this is what we, you know, this is why we do the band, you know, we're, uh, we're a band that just loves, you know, having that live interaction with the band and or with the audience. And uh, yeah, we just, I don't know, we love traveling, we love seeing the world, and it's like, you know, for people like us that don't have money, it's like, it, it totally, you know, it's a win-win for us. You know, we get to play music we love, and we get to, you know, see see the world, which we wouldn't be able to do if we stuck with our, you know, high school, just out of high school jobs, you know? So we, we were definitely very lucky that way. What was your job in high school or as you left high school? Um, well, when I, when I worked, like when I was at home, I grew up in the country. My dad was a carpenter, my mom was a school teacher. But there were always like farms all around. And so I had jobs, you know, it's obviously funny now because I'm a vegan, but I was shoveling chicken shit. I was, <laughs> you know, I'd get hired, like anytime, you know, so there'd be a turkey, turkey farmer that was, uh, you know, 
getting, uh, you know, needed, uh, whatever they call it, a shipment owner or whatever, they'd hire guys like me to load turkeys into these, you know, cages into these trucks and then, uh, you know, send them off. Um, what else did I do? Oh, I worked with my dad a lot. He's a carpenter, so every weekend, you know, I'd, I'd be uh, working with him every Saturday. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I was definitely uh, brought up to, you know, work and not be scared of it. So. No wonder you were vegan. Well, you know, that changed a little, that, that, that changed a lot, a lot later. I, I uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't come soon enough, but uh, it's funny how, I, I would have laughed if someone told me I would be vegan in my 30s when I was <laughs> 17. You know, hucking turkeys into the crates, oh which, are, which absolutely sickens me now. <laughs> that's, a, that's how it goes. That's yeah. the world. Things oh, change. Oh, <laughs> irony. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, you do a lot of posts about the vegan cartel. Can you tell me much about uh, the conception behind that or the creation of it? Well, it just kind of, I don't know, it just kind of like ideas tossed around between two of my friends. Um, you know, we. Like, we're, we're, we're not, like, none of us have been vegan forever, you know, like, I've been vegan for five years, and, you know, they've been vegan for a few other years, or for, ugh, I can't talk, for a few years, and, uh, yeah, it's just something that has become important to us, and once we kind of embraced the idea of it, it just, you know, kind of made more sense to, like, you know, talk about it, pass it on, because, like, like, what I was talking earlier about the scene standing for things, you know, that was kind of how I, you know, got myself educated initially, and the, in, you know, the, the beginning stages of that transition, you know, it's like, you know, PETA has always loosely been involved with, you know, the scene. Animal rights has always been talked about to some degree with different bands, including my favorite band, Propagani, which is about to play. You know, so those kind of seeds have been planted and, and whatever. So it's like, well, you know, now it's time for me to do the same thing, you know, or be a part of that with, you know, two of my friends that, you know, feel the same way. So, yeah, it's just going to be like, you know, we, we have a, a blog, a web store, so it's going to be just, you know, interviews with people that uh you know have been vegan for a while like you know we want to you know talk to people that have been doing it for a long time and just talk about their transition you know back in the day and how much easier it is now and because a lot of people are confused with how difficult it is or whatever but um yeah and just like post recipes um yeah whatever like just a little bit of a little bit of everything and maybe have some you know obnoxious t-shirts maybe not if not you know whatever you know just basically just my whole thing is that i don't want to force anything down anybody's throats but I do want to have a bit of a voice about it and, you know, just pop ideas into people's brain just uh, just to think about it. Even if they're not even going to make the switch, just to consider another side or, you know, if I can offer that, you know, or be a part of offering that. So. Fair enough. How do you suggest someone get started? Mm, well, it's, it's so different now than it was then. Like, the internet is just a wealth of information. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there, too, about why veganism is not good for you. Um, but... I'm definitely no pro athlete, but I keep very active and I feel I'm as fit as I've ever been in my life. And it's 100% on a vegan diet. So once you're cutting out, like, you know, because with, with a vegan diet, you're never ingesting any cholesterol. Like you get, you only get cholesterol from animal products. So, you know, none of that is clogging your arteries. And I'd love to do a lot of long distance running. And, uh, you know, I think that's a very important part of like just cleaning the system so you can be able to, you know, do these things for a long distance because that, you know, you're you're definitely working the heart. So if it's got to like, you know, push blood struggle, these, like yeah, it's kind of whack. So yeah, there's I don't know, like a good start. There's there's all kinds of, like some people just switch over cold turkey. They're never gonna eat another animal. The next person's gonna cut out red meat, chicken, fish, eggs, cheese. Then they're there, you know. So everybody kind of does things at their own pace, and it's like every bit counts. You know, it's you know, there's a lot of a lot of horrible things going on in the. Uh, in the uh, animal, whatever you call it, in industrial system. Ah, it's horrible. Chuck you know, and turkeys yeah. and chicken like, aside. Like sometimes sure. when you're driving down, you know, like some of these freeways and you just see these massive feedlots, it's just like, like there's hundreds of, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of cattle in there. And it's just like, all they do is stand in mud all day and, you know, wait to get fed. And, you know, it's like cow shorts. They're just waiting to die, you know, it's like that. Well, at uh, you definitely, well, I've, I've seen you before do signings for PETA. Are there any other charities that you guys support? Um, like with our band? Or not yourself. This, yeah, our, our band, like our band is definitely not like a vegan band or, right. or this or that. There's, you know, the drummer and myself are vegan. Um, there's others that are sympathetic towards the idea of an art, you know what I mean? So, um, but no, uh, like my other thing I'm involved with, Vegan Cartel, we want to start getting involved with things like uh, Sea Shepherd, um, 
if anybody's familiar with the show Whale Wars, they'll know that uh, connection with Sea Shepherd, uh, you know, defending uh, marine life, you know, where, you know, you're going to have people poaching in, you know, certain parts of the ocean that are supposed to actually be a sanctuary, like a safe place for these whales and whatnot. Um, other things like uh, there's also Farm Sanctuary, which is a organization that's been around for about 25, 30 years that, you know, rescues, like, farm animals that have been left to die sometimes. You know, they'll, they'll get a call and say, like, hey, there's this pile of pigs, dead pigs behind this, and we think there's one or two that are still alive. So, you know, if they get there in time, you know, they'll be able to rescue one or two of them and just kind of help them and then just put them in this safe place where they can live out the rest of their lives, you know, proper, the way they should. So, you know, those kind of things are things that we want to, you know, be a part of, you know, obviously not on a big scale because we don't have deep pockets, but, you know, even if it's just awareness, you know, like just getting the word out there is some maybe somebody with deep pockets that you don't know, and we'll be able to chuck them money because that's that kind of thing. That kind of thing is not free because these animals are not being sold for food. You know, it costs money to feed them and keep them. So, but yeah. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot of plans. What's up next for Comeback Kid? Uh, well, we got this tour that goes until the 11th this month, and then uh, we're going to be doing a Western Canadian Run in uh, November. Well, it, it'll start in Seattle, but that's the one you must take. Yeah, it's, starting. it's close enough to Canada. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's almost Canada. I wish it, <laughs> it almost was at one time, because the Columbia River that was at oh, one time right. considered... The border. It was, was going to be the border, because if you know, across this river from Portland is a town called Vancouver, Washington. I mean, yeah, Vancouver, it Washington. Makes, yeah. And then, uh, but then they decided to make it the 49th parallel. Or so whatever, just, so. so that's why, so that's why, you're, that's why you're hitting it. It's fine. Um, and we feel very at home in Seattle anyway. So, but anyways, yeah, we're going to be doing that Western Canadian swing that'll, you know, go from, you know, the West Coast to our home and in our hometown in Winnipeg with two, two shows there, and then uh, we'll be taking the rest of the year off, and then down under in January, so back to Australia. Sounds like you're because quite busy. Anybody knows how cold it is in Winnipeg. You always try to book those kind of southern hemisphere tours for January. That's genius. It makes total sense. Yeah. There's a reason four out of our five Australian tours have uh, been in uh, February, January. You know. <laughs> that makes total sense. Well, looking forward to more to come. This is Jackie with the CuttingEdgeCulture.com.